Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's video was requested to me by Michael on Patreon. Thank you so much for this case suggestion. As many of you may know, members of my Patreon family do get priority with case suggestions among other benefits such as members only posts, early access to videos, and personalized handwritten thank you cards from me. So if that sounds like something you may be interested in, make sure to go ahead and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. But anyways, this case is a very cold case, but this one is one that has a lot of very interesting theories. So I'm really curious to hear what all of you guys think. It's a very different case than one that I've ever covered here on my channel because it takes place in a completely different time period than now. So do make sure to keep that in mind as we go through this case. But either way, with that being said, Let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Richard Colvin Cox. Richard Colvin Cox was born the youngest of six siblings on July 25th, 1928 in Mansfield, Ohio to parents Rupert and Minnie Colvin Cox. Now, Richard's father passed away when Richard was only 10 years old. There are speculations for how he had passed, but as far as I have seen, the accepted manner was that he died as a result of diabetes. Now, he was a practicing Christian scientist, and those who believe in this ideology basically believe that disease is a product of mental error rather than an actual physical disorder. So they believe that sick people shouldn't actually be treated by medicine, but by prayer. So some believe that he didn't seek the proper medical attention for his diabetes and that is why he passed away from it. Because of this, his mother Minnie was left as the owner and operator of the family's insurance business, Rupert F. Cox Insurance Agency. So I didn't find out a ton more on his family life or his childhood, but I can only imagine how hectic his life must have been having a single mother who was working while also having seven children to care for. Throughout high school, Richard was pretty much always working. He wasn't really able to participate participate in after school activities like sports or anything like that because he was always working after school. During the summers, he held full-time jobs so he wasn't really able to participate in the fun summer activities during the summer either. Now, over one of these summers, he was actually working for a road crew in Mayhafer. I hope I'm saying that right. He actually fell and cut his arm really bad on a scythe, which is basically a sharp tool used for digging up dirt and crops. But when he got home to his mother, who was also a practicing Christian scientist, she refused to take him to the doctor. His cut got really infected as a result, and eventually his neighbor did end up taking him to the hospital. But either way, this cut left him with a pretty nasty scar on his arm. After graduating high school in 1946, Richard joined the U.S. Army. He ended up in the U.S. Constabulary, again, I hope I'm saying that right, which was basically created in 1946 after World War II to be some sort of police type work in Germany and Austria to maintain military and civil security and to control the borders in the United States zones. Basically, it was set up to keep an American police force presence in the American zones within these countries. By May of 1947, Richard was assigned to the 6th Constabulary Regiment on the American Occupation Zone in Coburg, Germany. So at first, Richard was in the S2 section of the headquarters company, so basically his responsibilities were more of the administrative, operational, and logistical side of things. But then by late 1947, he applied to and was accepted into West Point Academy, arriving there in January of 1948. Now, by all accounts, Richard did very well here. He was described as being very highly intelligent, ambitious, well-liked, and hardworking. He took care of himself and he enjoyed his time in the academy. He was ranked 100 out of 550 classmates, which isn't terrible. He even did athletics at West Point and competed in different national competitions. He also had a girlfriend named Betty Timmons from his hometown in Mansfield 
and the two seem to be doing pretty well despite him being in the army and going to all of these different places. The two had gotten engaged and planned to be married after he graduated from West Point. His life was very structured and he was very disciplined and every aspect of his life seemed to be going in just the right direction. Now at around 4.45 p.m. on January 7, 1950, Richard's classmate, Peter Haynes, who was charge of quarters in their cadet company, answered a phone call from a man asking to speak to Dick Cox. When Peter told this man that Richard wasn't in the room, the man said, well, look, when he comes in, tell him to come on down here to the hotel. Just tell him George called. He'll know who I am. We knew each other in Germany. I'm just here for a little while. Peter described this man's tone as being rough and patronizing, almost insulting. Peter also said that he couldn't be sure that this man's name was actually George because it didn't seem too credible at the time. But either way, when Richard was told about this phone call, he acted like he had no idea who this man could be. But then at 5.30 p.m., a man entered the guest hall and asked to see Richard. This man was described as being slightly shorter than six feet tall, weighing about 185 pounds, with light skin and hair, wearing a trench coat. Richard was notified and when he got down to the guest hall, Richard seemed very happy to see this man. They shook hands and spoke pretty normally. Richard had then signed out, saying that he would be having an off-campus dinner and then the two left together. About an hour and a half later, Richard came back to the school, signed in, and went up to his room. He had actually signed in with the time at 6.30 instead of 7.30 to make it look like he attended their cadet dinner formation, but of course, he actually hadn't. He was spending time with this other man. So this was actually a pretty big deal that he lied about this. They didn't notice at the time, but if they did, he could have been expelled for violating the school's honor code. So it's not really known why he chose to lie like this. Now, when he got back to his room, he actually admitted to his roommates that he didn't actually go to dinner with this man. They actually had just sat in a parked car and drank from his bottle of whiskey. He was actually pretty intoxicated, which his roommate said was very out of character for him. He then took a shower and then immediately fell asleep. He actually fell asleep slumped over his desk. So as a prank, his roommates actually took a picture of him being sound asleep at his desk. Now, when the 1030 drum call sounded that night, which is basically just a sound telling the cadets to go back to their rooms for the night, Richard suddenly sprung up from his sleep and ran into the hallway yelling something that sounded to his two roommates like Alice. But some believe that he was actually saying Alice kaputt, which is German for all is ended. We don't know what he actually said for sure, but his two roommates were very startled to say the least and found this very, very strange. But very quickly, Richard pulled himself together and went back to his room. His roommates were trying to ask questions about what just happened, but he just ignored them and went straight to bed. Now, the next morning, Richard had told his roommates a little bit more about the man that he had seen the night before. He told them that this man was a US Army Ranger who served alongside him in Germany. He described this man as being very morbid, saying that he would brag about taking the lives of the Germans during the war and how he would cut off their private parts after. Richard also told his roommates that this man had gotten a German girl pregnant, but then took her life to make sure that she didn't have the baby. He seemed to have a pretty intense disgust for this man but that didn't stop him from seeing him again that afternoon. He signed out like last time and then returned back to the school at around 4.30 p.m. Then the next weeks after that seemed pretty normal. He didn't see this man again during those days, but he had mentioned to his roommates that he hoped that he wouldn't have to see him again, confirming basically that he really did not like this man. Now on January 14th, Richard had spent his entire day just pretty much watching the basketball game. But then after this, he was seen once again talking to a strange man 
who is thought to be George. But this man seemed to be a completely different man than the one he was seen meeting with the week before, because this time a witness described him as having dark hair and being rough looking. After the two spoke, Richard went back to his room and told his roommate once again that he was signing out to have dinner with a visitor. His roommate said that he didn't seem apprehensive whatsoever to be going out with this man, but did say that Richard didn't really seem to be excited. He seemed to be kind of disgusted by this man just by the way he was talking about him. It almost seemed like Richard really did not want to see this man, but for whatever reason, he kinda had to go with him. So a little bit after 6 p.m., Richard left his room to go see George. And that was the last time that Richard was ever seen again. Now, Richard was supposed to get back at around 11 p.m. that night, but when he hadn't returned, no one was really alarmed yet because it wasn't uncommon for the cadets to be getting in a little bit late at night. When he still wasn't back by 2.30 a.m., it was reported to a superior officer that he was gone, but again, it wasn't uncommon for cadets to be out all night, despite knowing that when they got back, there would be consequences to face. So still, no one was quite panicked yet, but when he still wasn't back that next morning, so that Sunday morning, Richard's roommates told their superior officer everything that had happened the night before. At this point, the New York State Police and the US Criminal Investigation Division were notified. Richard's disappearance prompted a massive search. West Point was searched up and down by several ground troops with helicopters flying from above. They searched the nearby bodies of water. They drained the Lusk Reservoir and searched the banks of the Hudson River with another nearby pond being drained. The FBI eventually got involved in the search three days later after the disappearance and police started making public appeals over the radio for any information regarding Richard's disappearance. This search lasted for two months and eventually became the biggest manhunt in West Point history. It expanded nationwide, but still, they found nothing. They also searched the army records for anyone who served with Richard who matched the description of George, but this only led to two men who were found to be nowhere near West Point at the time. They even looked into his time served in Germany, but nothing looked out of the ordinary whatsoever. Some people thought that he may have just left on his own accord, but initially to police, this didn't seem likely at all because he had left $87 in his room, which is about $925 in today's money, and he left pretty much all of his personal belongings behind as well. They continued searching for Richard for years and years, but they found absolutely no trace of him, and by 1975, he was declared legally dead. But even then, his disappearance struck a chord with so many people, and the investigation into his disappearance did not stop there. Now, for quite some time, it seemed like the government agencies investigating Richard's disappearance were pretty secretive about their investigation. They weren't sharing any of their theories or what leads they were following. Richard's family and friends had asked over and over again for 15 years what the investigation was leading to, but they just gave him the runaround every single time. Now, there was a man named William F. McKee who had been a classmate and friend of Richard's when they were younger. A few decades after Richard's disappearance, William McGee became the Richland County prosecutor, so he should have had access to all of Richard's records and the investigation. Not only that, but he was also very trusted in the legal system. He was known and accepted by the FBI and cooperated on numerous cases of all levels. He grew particularly interested in Richard's case and wanted to look more into it. In 1969, he went into the FBI office in Ohio and mentioned to the agent in charge that he wanted to take a look at the Cox file. Apparently, this agent just got completely pale when he asked for it and just tried to play it off, trying to find an excuse not to give the file to him and just changing the subject. He looked to be incredibly nervous. He started sweating and his eyes were just darting back and forth. William could obviously tell that this man was nervous, 
so he was not surprised when he didn't end up getting his hands on these files. Throughout the years, he had occasionally sent an assistant or two up to the FBI office and asked them to speak with the agent in charge and asked for the Cox files. But one of his assistants reported that when he went to go speak to this agent, at first, he was very calm and mild-mannered when they were just kind of talking, but once he brought up the Cox file, he turned visibly white and kind of started shaking. Once again, these files did not end up in McKee's hands and it was made pretty clear to him at this point that someone much higher above him knew something that they didn't want to share with others. Then finally, by 1982, an investigative reporter for the news journal was finally able to get his hands on the Cox file. I don't really know how this man was able to get to them, but he did nonetheless. When he got these files, they were very heavily censored. They were covered in black lines, taking out a bunch of different paragraphs and sentences. Altogether, the file was missing a total of 165 pages. Of course, the mystery surrounding this case and the fact that everyone was so secretive led to numerous theories about what could have happened to Richard Colvin Cox. The first theory is probably the biggest theory that a lot of people believe, and that is that Richard left to work as a secret agent in the CIA. Now, the CIA was just starting to develop around 1950. They were just starting to recruit operatives to work in the post-war Europe to keep an eye on the Soviets. As we know, Richard had already served in the US Army in Germany near the communist border. He was also known to be very hardworking and was at the top of his class in terms of leadership potential. So maybe the CIA thought that he could be a powerful asset to them. This could be why so many people in the government got so nervous when McKee asked for these files. It could also be why we never learned the identity of these men who Richard was seen talking to before he disappeared if they were also undercover helping Richard get into his new secret life. Again, it's known that Richard worked very hard. He loved his country and he wanted to serve in whatever way that he knew. So maybe despite knowing that his family and friends would be looking for him, he took it as his duty to become an undercover agent. Now, the one thing that I don't understand about this theory is that why would he had been drinking with this man if this man was just there to help him go undercover? Why was he telling his roommates all of these weird stories? Now, it could be possible that he told them these things to throw them off. Maybe he knew that police would be looking for these men, so he wanted to sort of steer them in the direction of this man possibly being an army acquaintance. But still, the whole drinking thing just doesn't make sense to me unless he was really nervous and drank to calm his nerves or something like that. I just don't see why he would have let himself get so intoxicated if he was really meeting this man who was undercover, working for the CIA, and was helping him get into the CIA. I don't know, it's just weird to me. Now, there are other theories within this main theory. So, there is a book called Oblivion, where these two authors, Marshall Jacobs and Harry Malhafer, investigated Richard's disappearance and outlined what they found in this book. They had interviewed someone who was supposedly a retired CIA official who claimed that Richard was given a new name by the CIA and spent the Cold War smuggling scientists connected to Russia's nuclear program across the Iron Curtain. Now, the Iron Curtain was basically an ideological barrier set up by the Soviet Union after World War II to keep it separated from the West and other non-communist areas. Another theory within this theory is that Richard was stationed in Cuba to help speak Russian there to keep them from going communist as well. The reason that many people think that this could be a possibility is because there had been numerous unconfirmed sightings of Richard in Florida, one of which we will get into later, which is known to be where a lot of Cubans go when they do come over to the US. The next theory is that Richard was possibly taken out by his enemies. Now, rumors came about saying that he had witnessed a murder in Germany and he had testified at this trial. It's possible that whoever he had testified against was maybe released or someone connected to who he testified against 
came over to the US, found him, and harmed him. He could have also witnessed some black market activities that made him a target. Either way, it's possible that during his time in Germany, he witnessed something that maybe he shouldn't have. He became a target. So someone came out, found him, and took him out. The next theory is that Richard just left to start a new life. Now, the main thing that we mentioned earlier about why police didn't think that he had just left was that $87 that he left behind in his room. However, police eventually came around to the fact and admitted that he still could have left without taking his money with him. He was in this incredibly rigorous program and it would have just been shameful if he decided to leave. Now, it was also speculated in the book Oblivion that Richard may have actually been gay. I don't know exactly what led them to that conclusion, but they apparently did have something that made him think that this was the case. I just don't exactly know what it was, but clearly something stood out to them to make them think that maybe this could be possible. This was the 1950s and being gay just was not accepted, especially for a man in the military. He could have left for the simple fact that he just didn't want people to find out about him being gay. Being gay at that time totally could have ruined his career and made an embarrassment out of him. So maybe because of this, he just decided to leave. Now, also within this theory, the authors of Oblivion had learned about a man named Robert W. Frisbee, who was the suspect in another murder case, who previously went by the name Robert Dion. Robert Dion had actually been stationed at Fort Knox the same time as Richard, so it's very possible and probable that the two knew each other. Robert was known for being involved in making fake IDs, and this man seemed to have the same description as George. So maybe whether the speculation of him being gay is true or not, he decided to recruit the help of Robert to help him leave. Maybe the first time Robert had called him using the name George, he didn't recognize him and he was only calling to maybe have a chat with Richard for old time's sake. Maybe this is why they had just drank together that night. But then maybe that's when they hatched the plan for Richard to go missing, especially if he was already thinking of some way to do so. So maybe Richard finally saw this as an opportunity to get the new identity that he had been wanting. We really don't know if there's honestly any evidence pointing to this theory at all. And honestly, it is all pure speculation, but I do think it is interesting. So sort of going along with this theory and the possibility of him being an undercover CIA agent, there were actually two reported sightings of Richard after he disappeared. So the first one was in 1954, when a man who had known Richard in the army said that he had actually ran into Richard at a bus stop in Washington, DC. He said that the two had spoken briefly, but that Richard seemed very agitated. After only a few minutes of chatting, Richard had apparently very abruptly cut him off and just walked away. This man was very confident that this was Richard, and he said that the only reason he hadn't come forward with this information earlier is because he just didn't know that Richard was missing at the time. The next sighting took place at a bar in Florida in 1960. Apparently, an undercover FBI agent had been chatting with a man named R.C. Mansfield, but eventually, this man admitted to him that his real name was Richard Colvin Cox. Again, at the time, he didn't realize that Richard had been a missing person, but when he did later realize, he actually tried to set up another meeting with this man, but never heard back from him. So these sightings to me do seem kind of credible, especially the one from a friend who recognized him. It doesn't seem like a friend who had known him personally could just somehow mistake him for someone else. However, I am a little bit skeptical of the Florida sighting because I just feel like with Richard being undercover all of that time, he wouldn't still be going around telling people his real name. I don't know the context of the conversation. I don't know the context of their relationship, how close these men actually were. He was just described as an acquaintance to this man, but it just doesn't seem likely to me that he'd be going around telling people his real name 
all these years later of being undercover. But I don't know, it could be credible. So those are pretty much all of the main theories in this case. As for who George is, no one was ever able to identify this strange man. However, theories speculate that he must be connected to Richard's disappearance. Whether he had harmed him or helped him change his identity or recruited him into the CIA, I definitely believe that if they were ever able to figure out who this man was, that we could know exactly what happened to Richard. Personally, I have no idea what to think. Now, given the time period and the fact that he was in the military academy, I can see how him being in the CIA could be a plausible theory. There's not very many cases where if this came up as a theory that I actually might think it could be true, but this case is different. Either that, or I do think that it's possible that something that happened in the war led to him being harmed. When it comes to the alcohol that he had drank that night, it makes me honestly sort of lean towards something happening to him. I feel like this George guy was someone that Richard clearly knew, but maybe this man was trying to harm him or get information out of him. Maybe this man was someone that Richard knew and that he sort of flipped or something or was forced to come and find Richard and get information that he knew out of him. So in order to do that, he met up with him and maybe that's why Richard got so intoxicated. Maybe whoever this man was gave him all of this alcohol in order to get him to talk about something that he had seen. Maybe Richard really did see him kill his girlfriend and do a whole number of awful things and that's why they got rid of Richard. The fact that he had drank with this guy kind of does point me away from the CIA theory because why would he be drinking with this guy if he was trying to get recruited into the CIA? Unless they were just trying to be buddy-buddy first before he actually made the commitment, I don't know. But it really does stand out to me and it's the one thing that's pointing me away from this whole CIA theory and points me towards him being harmed. I personally don't think that he would have left on his own accord unless it was for the CIA. I just don't think that he had a reason to want to up and leave his life so suddenly, especially given the fact that he had just met with these two guys right before he left. I just don't see why he would have done that if he was just getting up and leaving. So to me, that seems like the least likely theory, but now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Richard left willingly? Do you think that he worked undercover as a CIA agent? Or do you think that someone harmed him? please let me know down below. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Also, if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please feel free to send those over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.